Good morning, everybody. I'm glad um, we are not distracted this morning by uh, other things going on in Washington. Um, for those of you who may have missed the first presentation um, because of a variety of reasons, um, Fletcher's first talk began with what we call the trek of about of a uh, entire plantation of 100 black slaves walking to the Gainesville area in um, 1830 from South Carolina. Um, and it traced the rise of antebellum King Cotton, um, the disaster of the Civil War. And that first presentation ended with the rise of Jim Crow in the horrors of invidious segregation in the 19th century before World War I. The promo for the second talk today will pick up with World War I and the lynching of Black people in the county. Um, Fletcher is going to trace Black life in Gainesville during the, the, the Depression and will examine the rise of the Fifth Avenue Pleasant Street neighborhood. And I don't know how many of you saw his articles on this in the sun, um, but they are certainly worth reading and you can Google them and read them. They're, they're wonderful articles and they're short. They, they don't take a lot of time. But this neighborhood was an entire vibrant bustling city of black people in a virtually closed off white city um, within the city of Gainesville. Um, Fletcher then is gonna look at the civil rights era of desegregation in Gainesville. And finally, our current elected officials and the racial disparities that still exist in this county. So with that, I turn the presentation over to Fletcher. Well, thank you, Ellen. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Let's see. Um, <clears throat> in the age of Zoom, you have to be sure your microphone's on. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to just sort of uh, repeat what uh, Ellen said for a second, kind of go over what we talked about a little bit uh, last time, uh, last Wednesday, and then uh, we'll work through right through to 2021. And um, I'm free to hang on and talk and chat and answer questions and, uh, and all um, after the formal presentation. So um, Ellen, uh, <clears throat> Julianne, tell me um, uh, when we have to cut it off, but I'm just happy to hang out here and, and chat. So keep your questions uh, to the end if you want to with so many people and we'll get a very active uh, Q&A going at the end of this. But first of all, as, as Alan said, let's just review what we did last time. Um, here's the outline that I have that Alan mentioned uh, from our last presentation. We talked about um, black slaves escaping from places like Georgia and Alabama and coming down to live in Micanopy under Chief Micanopy, you know, when the land was uh, controlled by the, the Spanish and the English. And um, we, we talked about blacks and plantations here in Alashua County. And we looked at three plantations, if we remember. We looked at Hale Plantation and we looked at Serenola, which I believe uh, Oak Hammock is on the grounds of uh, Serenola. It's just around the corner from uh, Oak Hammock, uh, <clears throat> the, the um, historical marker is. And then we looked at uh, uh, one downtown. And uh, we looked at uh, the Civil War, the disaster, the, the Civil War, and um, and then re reconstruction and the co construction of the uh, Union Academy, which uh, was what we think of as downtown now. And as Ellen said, the so many slaves walking, or former slaves walking to uh, Gainesville from South Carolina. And we looked at uh, the rise of Jim Crow. Um, I spell my name C-R-O-W-E, so I don't have uh, any relationship to this C-R-O-W Jim Crow. But um, we looked at Plessy versus Ferguson, the Supreme Court decision that allowed separate but equal. And then we looked at um, the horror of uh, lynching of blacks in uh, Alachua County and the Rosewood massacre of uh, 1923. So as Ellen said, um, we need to go over some of this. So I'm going, 
since uh, last time I talked a little too fast, I think I want to just take a few minutes to sort of repeat some of the stuff that you saw last time. Uh, so if you're already familiar with this, you can go to sleep for a couple of slides. But let's just review a couple of those slides that we had last time. Um, uh, but before I do that, I just want to talk about it, as Ellen said, what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, and we're going to talk about um, blacks in uh, Gainesville during and after World War II and the rise of the, the Cotton Club. And uh, then we're going to talk about Gainesville during the Civil Rights era, uh, which was very big and very bloody here in Gainesville. And uh, Mike Gingler is going to talk about that uh, in another uh, session here in this course. And then we'll talk about uh, Blacks in Gainesville in the 21st century, as Ellen said. But let's just look at a couple of the slides that we went over last time. Here's one that you saw last time. This one is maybe the most horrific of all the horrifying slides that we have in this course. Um, six Blacks were lynched in News Newberry in 1916. And you, you, people living in Oak Hammock, can drive out to Pleasant Plains United Methodist Church just out on the uh, Newberry Road, you see the sign out there, and turn in, it's on the north side of the road. And you can actually see the headstones of these people. It's, it's just a, a, a horrifying, horrifying event. So far, um, the Reconciliation Commission has uh, recorded 46 cases of lynchings in, uh, in Alachua County. And of course, there were probably more than that that weren't reported. Um, let's, oh, let's see, I went the wrong way here. Sorry about that. But let's just talk about the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. Nationwide, the Ku Klux Klan really uh, flourished right after the end of World War I, which you remember is 1919. So it was big here in Alachua County. The, um, the case that I have here on this particular slide, which is slide five, actually is a case uh, about a, a white man, which you say, well, that's not part of the history of blacks in Alachua County, but in actuality, it shows you the power of the Ku Klux Klan. So let's look at this one for a second. There was a, um, a young Catholic priest living here in Gainesville who had uh, responsibilities at University of Florida, who the Ku Klux Klan didn't like. Um, and one day they, uh, they, they uh, kidnapped him. They took him over to uh, Palatka and dumped him in a uh, Catholic Church over there, and they castrated him. Now, the Ku Klux Klan was in cahoots with the chief of police of Gainesville at that time, and um, there was never any sort of uh, punishment or, or criminal uh, indictment whatsoever from the rise of the Klan uh, doing such a horrifying thing. And, um, and that shows you the power of the Ku Klux Klan here uh, in this city and in this county. Now you saw this slide about Rosewood uh, last time, but I just wanted to repeat it. You know, when you ride, drive down to Cedar Key, you go about an hour outside of uh, Gainesville, and on the left, you'll see the uh, the big historical marker about the Rosewood massacre. If you haven't stopped to read that um, historical marker, or if you haven't rented the movie Rosewood, you really need to. It's just a, a, a terrifying, uh, slice of our history, but unfortunately it is our history. Uh, in, in Rosewood, the, the whites really truly burned down the structures of, of the plaques in this little town down there. Um, they burned down every structure it was reported. But what happened was that Rosewood was on the uh, railroad, the Cross Florida Railroad, and a lot of children, black children, were put on the train and they rode up here to Gainesville they got off here and their lives were saved. Otherwise, who knows what would have happened to them. Um, but some of them are still alive and uh, there have been quite a few uh, books and articles and even a, a, a movie written and so forth to describe the uh, horrifying events of, of Rosewood. Um, but again, no arrests were made and um, the, the event was really covered over for years and years and years, but Today, of course, it's out in the open. Uh, but that's the kind of setting that blacks have had to face in Gainesville for all these years. 
Ellen talked about the uh, the rise of the uh, uh, Pleasant Street Fifth Avenue neighborhood. Um, as, as I wrote about it in the uh, Gainesville newspaper, the uh, the the, new, the uh, neighborhood is today found just east of Sweetberries. I, I imagine everybody sitting here in this course has uh, at least had some ice cream at Sweetberries at least once uh, over there on uh, 13th Street. But the neighborhood is just east of of what is today Sweetberries. Um, but as Ellen said, after World War I, with the separate but equal provisions of uh, the laws that were in effect, what grew up here in Gainesville was a community of black people that was a self-contained city within a city. It was incredible. Um, you'll see here on the slide seven, this bottom section, you can read it with me, in one block area, uh, the district contained three grocery stores, four lunch grills, a laundry, two billiard halls, a theater, an insurance agency, and a building contractor, all black owned. To say nothing about black churches, um, black um, funeral homes, and so forth. It was, it was quite something. It was a real, honest to God, um, bustling, vibrant, uh, commercially viable uh, city within a city, but no contact with white people, essentially. Here's another map that shows that area. You can see Sweetberries here um, on 13th Street and Staples, which you know is on uh, 13th there. And uh, this neighborhood that we're talking about is south of the police station and it's north of 706. Now, 706 restaurant, I think is closed now, unfortunately, but um, it's, it's west of the Santa Fe uh, Blood Center where you may have gone for Santa Fe courses or something, but it's, it's, it's right in that area. Um, today, it, it looks like uh, a scene from a, a Western movie, just uh, totally a, a dead area, totally vacant. But in those days, as I said, it had doctors, lawyers, beauty parlors, it had a black hospital, it had uh, taxis, it had a black library. It was, it was really something. And, that sort of stuff is is uh, essentially gone now. An entire city within a city. In the next slides, I'd like to uh, just look at some of the uh, well-known people or well-known uh, buildings that were in uh, this area. Uh, the first one here on this slide uh, is one about uh, A.Q. Jones. A.Q. Jones was a leader of black education. Uh, in Gainesville, Lashua County. And his house today, which you see in this little picture right here, is an, a museum. It's got a historical marker out in front of it. And you can go there and visit. Um, it's directly across from the A.Q. Jones Center, which is a, a two-story red brick building that uh, he helped build um, back after World War I. Um, he was able to get uh, that school accredited, uh, which is really something. And they had maybe the world's best football team. As, to my memory, I don't think they ever lost a game. Just just incredible football game. But um, he had a real high academic standards for the students there. And the students could get an accredited uh, full high school diploma there, which was, of course, very unusual in the days after World War I. This is a uh, picture of the structure that you saw last time. It's the uh, Greater Liberty Hill uh, Church building that was a schoolhouse. Um, Ellen, if you ever trying to think of projects for people uh, at Oak Hammock, you could have a, organize a project to have Oak Hammock people go over and uh, put a coat of paint on this structure. Now, this is uh, really a very historic st structure because this is one of the few remaining uh, black schoolhouses around, but this was a schoolhouse in the 19th century uh, for black kids that still exists. Um, needs a coat of paint, but you can see what uh, we're looking at. This one was built in uh, 1892, but it's not very far from Oak Hammock. It's just over on, uh, on 23rd, on the north side of 23rd. But, but uh, there were a few um, educational opportunities uh, for black kids in those days.
This is the old uh, Lincoln High School. I mentioned it earlier. This is across the street from A.Q. Jones' uh, house or museum. And uh, uh, this was a, a real center of uh, black education, both uh, before World War II and for a while after World War II. It's not used as a high school now, but uh, it's still part of the uh, Atlanta school system. Here's a person I'd like us uh, to meet here, um, who lived in that community. His name is Jesse Aaron. Some of you may have heard of him as, as a folk artist. Um, here's an example of some of his work. He used to go out into uh, the the uh, forest and bring in wood and then carve it and turn it into uh, wooden structures. And um, this particular one is in the foyer of the city hall downtown, so it's owned by the city, uh, which I particularly like. But he did a lot of these like this as a folk artist. And he's collected now and his uh, work is, is quite valuable now. Um, he did this basically in retirement. Uh, when he was working, he, he would work as a, a carpenter, so he really knew how to do wood. But um, uh, in retirement, he, he did uh, these wooden uh, sculptures that are today uh, uh, quite memorable. I mentioned earlier that um, in the black community, we had funeral homes. You, you may know in the black uh, community, funeral homes have uh, quite a bit of prominence. Um, here are two pictured on this slide right here, uh, slide 13, uh, Duncan Brothers, which is on Fifth Avenue right now. And um, here's the Chestnut Funeral Home, which is uh, over on 8, which you've probably driven by dozens and dozens and dozens of times. Um, Ellen mentioned that uh, a lot of black people walked from South Carolina to uh, uh, Gainesville. One of those people that walked down was um, uh, Johnson Chestnut and his son, Charles Chestnut, actually founded this funeral home, which today is still very viable, as you can see in this uh, picture that I took. Um, it's, it's a very uh, prominent part of the black community there. Uh, also on Fifth Avenue, we, we have Fletcher's, uh, not named for me, but uh, anyway, uh, Fletcher's uh, bar. So black bars uh, were, of course, very uh, prominent for entertainment. Uh, there was the Wigwam Bar, Fletcher's Lounge, and so forth. But uh, there's kind of a downside to this. When, when I interviewed uh, people about Fletcher's Bar, they said, you know, only four people were killed there. So um, that's really something. In fact, you may have seen in the Gainesville Sun just recently, there was uh, an article uh, talking about uh, security at uh, Fletcher's. But, uh, but that was a, certainly part of the Fifth Avenue culture. And here's a picture taken uh, before World War II about what the interior looked like. And of course, uh, black churches played a very prominent role in the black community, as you know. There's this picture here is one of Mount Pleasant Methodist Church. Uh, this Methodist Church is, is very prominent. It's not an AME church. Uh, it, it's a, it's part of the United Methodist Church uh, structure or network, and so this this is a a major part of the uh, Methodist uh, operations in uh, Florida and the nation as a whole. The picture on the left, of course, is uh, what the membership looked like back in the uh, 19th century, but that has taken a very prominent role. In fact, there's a, a Mount Pleasant Methodist Church cemetery on uh, on 13th that you may have seen uh, across from the McDonald's there. Here is a picture of um, Greater Bethel Church back in the uh, 19th century. Uh, that's not what it looks like today, but that's what it looked like at that time uh, after World War, uh, no, after the Civil War. And of course, there were uh, black doctors and dentists in the Fifth Avenue Pleasant Street area. Here are two that became quite prominent. Um, you can see in the picture on the right, you can see on, on the left is Dr. Cosby, and then on the right is uh, Dr. Banks. Uh, their offices uh, 
exists today, at least the, the building does, but um, it, it's not used for dentistry or doctors at all. But uh, the name Cosby has been uh, very prominent, not just in the black community, but in Gainesville and Alachua. Um, uh, Dr. Cosby married uh, Leslie Parker, and you see a picture of their daughter, one of their daughters here, Carolyn. Uh, she became a physicist. And uh, you know, if you've been reading the Gainesville Sun, you'll know that they've changed the name of one of the elementary schools here in town to the Carolyn Beatrice Parker Elementary School to commemorate her contribution. She was uh, prominent in plutonium. Um, and you can see here uh, what she looked like. So uh, black doctors and black dentists were able to practice, but it was, of course, uh, absolutely 100% segregated until the um, civil rights movement, of course. And um, here's uh, the home of uh, Dr. Stafford, a dentist. If you see the picture on the right here, you see a little um, uh, alcove on the right, that's where his dentist office was. So it was really connected adjacent to his house. On the bottom here in the pink, you can see what the house looks like today. It's actually owned by the city of Gainesville, but you can see it's in pretty bad uh, disrepair. But he practiced here uh, before World War II uh, when things were very segregated. But it is obvious here that uh, black people were able to get uh, dental care uh, before World War II. Now here, uh, slide 19, is a picture of what was called the Black Hospital. There was an Alachua General Hospital that you may well know that was located on the south side of university. It's no longer there, but it was really not open to, uh, to blacks particularly. So after World War I, um, Jenny Rowe opened up this quote unquote hospital in her house uh, on Third Avenue. And this is what it looks like today. The, the house is still there, but it was a, um, what we today would probably call an emergency walk-in clinic but they actually did quote unquote surgery there. Um, what they would do would be to take drapes like um, uh, sheets and try to sanitize them and put them over the furniture and actually do surgery right there in her living room. So it was the only way that um, the blacks could get uh, standard hospital care. Now, later on, of course, blacks were allowed to practice at the uh, Atlanta, uh, the Alachua Hospital and later, of course, at Shands and so forth. But um, after World War I, this was where blacks could get uh, treated. And, um, and then it was closed down later, later on. Uh, but this, this is what uh, existed. One name uh, that was very well known in uh, black medicine here in Gainesville was uh, that of Dr. Cullen Banks. Uh, he was a voice for, for reason and for uh, having better, warmer relations uh, between the races. He was a member of the NAACP, and uh, uh, he, he was a, a very prominent and uh, well-respected uh, doctor. But I, I just want to stress that he was the first black doctor to have full privileges at Alachua General. So you can believe that that was a, a major a change, major improvement when um, when he was given full rights there. And um, uh, he practiced uh, medicine. He, he was um, fully accredited and fully certified. So, so things had begun to change uh, by World War II. Another doctor uh, had a different story. His name was Dr. Robert Ayers. You see here a copy of the 1907 uh, city directory here in Gainesville and you can see that he actually had a telephone in 1907 which was very 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 rare but he was a practicing doctor as you can see. Um, his son was a graduate of, of Harvard in 1919 but um, he himself uh, uh, was not given privileges at Alastria General Hospital so he moved on and left. So his story is a little different from uh, Dr. Banks, but um, but you can see that the house uh, still exists. 
And of course, in the uh, Fifth Avenue, Pleasant Street area, there were obviously stores. Here's a picture of two stores. But I just want to point out some things here. Here's a picture on the right of um, the uh, what Sixth Avenue looked like in 1948. This is after uh, World War II. And notice that the street is not paved and it looks like a scene out of a Western movie or something. Um, just not at all financially viable, certainly not economically prosperous at all. But this is uh, where you would go to buy your groceries. The, the scene on the, uh, the left is called a sundry store. Do we use the term sundry anymore? I'm, I'm, I haven't heard that word in a long time. Um, at the sundry store, you could get a Coke or get some ice cream or a snack or something like that, called it a luncheonette. Uh, this was black owned and by a person who was very prominent in the black community. Uh, <clears throat> now here's something you may never have heard about before. Everybody listening to this uh, uh, talk today certainly knows the term butlers and is in Butler Plaza. But do you know who Clark Butler was? Clark Butler uh, started a, a market on 8th Avenue, where the police station is now, uh, that serviced the marketing needs, the grocery needs of blacks in that community. Um, but during World War II, there had been an airfield where Butler Plaza is now. Uh, but of course, it was sort of de declared surplus after the end of the war. And he was able to buy much of that airfield out there and uh, put in stores that we think of as Butler Plaza today. Uh, but he came, became quite prominent. He was a white man, but the uh, people that came to this market that we see here were, of course, the, the blacks who lived in that uh, local area. He became quite prominent. He became uh, mayor of Gainesville for a while. This particular store burned down, so we're lucky to have a picture of it. But this is where the, the blacks of the Pleasanton Street, Fifth Avenue uh, area would, would be able to get their uh, groceries. And of course, there were restaurants in this uh, black area. Here's one that uh, you may have heard of or may have gone to. Uh, this was Mama Lowe's, and uh, she was uh, right here in the picture on the right. Her restaurant was popular with both whites and blacks, and uh, she had soul food. I took this picture that you see on the left where it says Mom's Kitchen. Uh, I just took this a, a few years ago. This sign still exists. So you can see it if you go on Fifth Avenue and it's on the north side of the street at a house that's painted in uh, orange and green. You guys know what orange and green signifies? Yeah, it's the uh, colors of Florida a and m So um, this, this sign still exists, uh, although it's getting older every year, obviously. Uh, but uh, if some of you may have gone to University of Florida, say after World War II sometime, you might have actually gone to mom's kitchen to get soul food. Maybe the, the best known restaurant along Fifth Avenue was Sarah's restaurant. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, Sarah for a while here. She was a, a quite a, a promoter, an entrepreneur. And it, she was the person who was behind the uh, construction of the Cotton Club. This was her restaurant on Fifth Avenue. It no longer exists. But this picture, is, of course, shows what it looked like, say, right after World War II. Go down here, there's slide 26. Um, here's a picture of what the Cotton Club looks like today. What happened was that Sarah McKnight, whose restaurant we just saw in the last slide, was able to purchase a, a surplus PX building um, <clears throat> from Camp Blanding, which you know is uh, north of here. And uh, they sawed it apart in pieces and brought it down to a black community here in downtown Gainesville, put it back together, and uh, they started the uh, Cotton Club for entertainment on what was called the Chitlin Circus, Circuit. And, um, and it operated after World War II for a while, but it was actually closed down by the city fathers because um, white University of Florida students 
would come over to hear jazz and black entertainment and the uh, White City Fathers did not like that at all. So the Cotton Club lost its license. But you see here in this picture that it's been restored and uh, it's possible to go down there and hear entertainment today. Um, during the time that the Cotton Club was in its heyday after World War II, there were a lot of uh, black entertainers that came through Gainesville, uh, people whose names later on became very prominent uh, nationwide, especially on television. You see here in this slide a, a few of the names of uh, black entertainers that came through. Uh, you can see Cab Calloway, Ella Fitzgerald, Duke Ellington, B.B. King, Ray Charles, James Brown, Dizzy Gillespie, and so forth. Um, people who certainly achieved all sorts of prominence nationwide. You recognize the, the, the guy in the picture on the right here? Yeah, uh, it's Ray Charles. Ray Charles actually grew up here in North Florida, but of course uh, became very uh, well known nationwide, obviously, as he got more and more famous. Also in terms of uh, black entertainment was the Rose Theater. Uh, you know what a Quonset hut is? Yeah, the, the building on the left is a Quonset hut, named for a town in Connecticut. Th those were um, produced in mass during World War II and uh, then were declared surplus. So one of the Quonset huts was dragged into Gainesville and served as the place where black movies were shown. Um, so this, this is where you would go to see black movies after World War II, at the Rose Theater. If you remember uh, the last session of this course, last time I talked, I talked about the railroad coming through in downtown Gainesville. And I said that a lot of the crew of the, uh, the railroad trains that came through needed a place to stay at night. So uh, what happened was that a house was turned into uh, a quote unquote hotel and uh, it was a place where a black, black people could stay. Uh, it was the only hotel open to blacks after World War II and um, it was listed in the Green Book. Did, did you guys uh, see the movie, The Green Book? Remember a, a few years ago, it won the Academy Award for the best film of the year. And um, this structure called the Dunbar Hotel was the only structure listed in the Green Book where uh, blacks could sp spend the night. Uh, so a number of uh, pretty famous uh, blacks that had come through Gainesville uh, actually spent the night here at this hotel. Uh, you can see here on this slide 28 that um, some of the ones that signed the guest register were, you know, Sam Cooke, Sammy Davis Jr., who you've seen on television, Duke Ellington, Ella Fitzgerald and so forth, they all stayed here. Um, the building still exists. When, you, when you're in the, uh, the area of the police station, you're in the parking lot of the police station, if you look to the, uh, the west, uh, the, the first building west of the police station parking lot is, is this building. I don't think it's pink today. I don't believe it's still pink, but anyway, um, it, it still exists. It's not a hotel. Uh, it's been used for other purposes. It was owned by the city for a while, but of course it still exists. And of course the, the stories and the ghosts from it uh, are still there. So uh, today the uh, chief of police can look out of his window at the police station and look at this uh, Dunbar Hotel and only think about the, the stories of uh, the blacks that were forced to stay here. And then the civil rights era. Now, I believe in this course, Mike Gengor is going to talk about the book that he wrote uh, about the uh, civil rights era in Gainesville and the desegregation of Gainesville High School. So I'm not going to spend much time today talking about it. Uh, you'll have a whole course t uh, lecture from, from Mike about that. I had lunch with Mike uh, a couple of months ago, and we, we talked about this. Um, if you remember, um, the Supreme Court in the United States in the Brown versus Board of Education of T Topeka, Kansas in 1954, handed down the decision that um, we had to have integration in public schools. That didn't result in integration immediately. So what happened in Gainesville was that 
the uh, 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 blacks sued, the, the suit went to the Supreme Court, and in late 1969, the Supreme Court ordered immediate desegregation in Gainesville, Gainesville High School, which right in the middle of the school year. Now you can imagine what a, <laughs> a turbulence that it caused right in the middle of the school year, but it did. And, um, and you'll learn a lot more about that from Mike Gingler. So suffice it to say, that was one heck of a time in the uh, history of Gainesville and for all the, the black students that suddenly flooded into Gainesville High School and so forth. Um, <clears throat> a lot of stories that came out of that, I can tell you. Well, as I said earlier, in the black community, of course, black churches were very prominent. Um, here's one that I'd like to mention for a moment here this morning. Um, here's a picture of T.A. Wright. He was the pastor of Mount Carmel Baptist Church for 45 years. And today, um, Mount Carmel Baptist Church is down on Fifth Avenue, down at the east. Uh, East End of uh, Fifth Avenue, and um, we have a historical marker out in front because the, the church and the work of T.A. Wright uh, is very historically important. He was a very prominent leader of the NAACP and the desegregation movements. Down in the basement of the church, uh, young people, like high school kids, would gather to plan um, desegregation marches and to make their signs that they would hold up uh, before the news cameras in these marches. And so uh, the, the church was sort of a center of the desegregation movement. And it was a, a center of black improvement uh, at that time. So you can see here these uh, numbers here in the, the second bullet, you can see that uh, under right, the church membership grew from about 400 to about 700 in 1986. So uh, he was very successful both in desegregation and in uh, management of the church. So that's Mount Carmel Baptist Church. And by the way, just as a footnote, uh, there is a program to invite, uh, especially white people, to go through the church. And they explain where all the desegregation events occurred and the various features of the church architecturally and so forth. So it's something, Ellen, you might think about for future programs that uh, Oak Hammock, if people wanted to take that tour of the of this historical church. Well, um, before uh, Reverend Wright had served in Gainesville, he worked with uh, Martin Luther King over in St. Augustine. And so in the 1960s, Martin Luther King uh, decided to target St. Augustine for the desegregation marches and so forth. Um, and so you just had one huge headline after the other. If you guys lived in Gainesville or in North Florida at the time, you remember the, the headlines. Here's a famous news photograph, a picture that appeared, I think, in just about every newspaper in the nation of a uh, owner of a motel in St. Augustine pouring uretic acid uh, on blacks that had gotten in his swimming pool, trying to get them out. So Reverend Wright was uh, affiliated with Martin Luther King's movement. And as you know, uh, desegregation worked and uh, the segregated laws uh, there in effect in St. Augustine were uh, put set aside. And we certainly had uh, desegregation in St. Augustine. And then of course, Reverend Wright moved over here to Gainesville and was able to use some of those same techniques. But here's something I, I want to uh, have you think about. Here is a registration certificate, a voter registration certificate for Dr. Cosby, who you saw a picture of a few slides back. Remember a, a dentist? Um, this is his voter registration uh, dated 1958. Remember that the Supreme Court decision, uh, Board versus Board of Education, was 1954. So this was four years after this, after that, but the desegregation of Gainesville High School was 1969. So this is over 10 years before um, all the desegregation uh, hullabaloo here in Gainesville. But Dr. Uh, Cosby was so excited to be able to register to vote, he took a picture of his voter registration certificate and saved it as a family heirloom. Uh, it, and today, of course, I found this down at the University of Florida uh, 
Rare Books uh, Library, which is called the, the East Library. Um, think of that. Did you ever take a picture of your voter registration certificate? I don't know that you did, <clears throat> but he he knew how important that was in 1958, and it became a family heirloom. Also, as part of the uh, desegregation movement here in Gainesville, we have to use the name Rosa B. Williams. Um, hold, on, hold on a second here. I'm trying to start them up. There, sorry about that. Um, Rosa Williams was the vice president of the local NAACP. So she was um, in charge of a lot of the demonstrations and the marches for uh, desegregation here in Gainesville. She was the one, for example, who led the picketing at the Florida Theater. Now, you, you know which one the Florida Theater is, I think, right? It's down uh, on University, uh, just west of what is today the, the modern library. Uh, it still says the marquee, it says Florida Theater out in front, but it's not used as a theater. It's just a, a hulk right now. But that was where you would go to see movies if you were a white person in Gainesville after World War II. And, um, and she was called the most powerful woman in, in Gainesville. Very, very powerful. She, she could get all sorts of people to turn out for these marches. So today, you can see the picture at the bottom here of slide 33. Um, there is a Rosa B. Williams Center named for her. Um, it's the building that the, what, what was called the Library for Quote Unquote Colors was located uh, before desegregation. And now it's the Rosa B. Williams Center. Now, some of you may have um, been undergraduates at the University of Florida uh, back in the 1960s. And it's really quite possible that if, if you were a student back in those days, uh, you may remember YT. YT had a, a barbecue stand, which you see pictured right here, um, that was right in the parking lot of what is today uh, Sweetberry. So it was located right behind what is today Sweetberry, just off uh, 13. And so therefore, it was walking distance uh, to the University of Florida campus. And it was very popular with the uh, students and, of course, very popular with black people. Um, YT himself was a voice of reason and reconciliation among the races uh, back in the 1960s. So he wanted to have peace among the, the races and was well known to, as a guy who would try to keep the temperature down. But uh, if you went to YT's, you probably remember the fact that it was impossible to order something that wasn't hot. So you see here on slide 35 is a, um, uh, a copy of what his menu looked like. And so you can see here in this little graphic that you could order, let's see, what does it say? You could order your barbecue mild medium, contrast, hot, red hot, super red hot, super duper, and super saber jet. And then one that was so hot, it was unnamed. <laughs> it, he would not sell the super uh, hot sauce to the white guys because he said they were too wimpy. They couldn't take it. Um, one customer actually they, um, had to go to the hospital for eating uh, his hot sauce. But, <laughs> But anyway, that was a very popular uh, place to eat. And, um, and so it was a place that both blacks and whites catered. So what about today? Here we are in the 21st century. Well, all these horrific things that we've been talking about so far in this little talk are turned around today in many ways. Just, just look at what we have here in this graphic. Look. On our city commission, we have two black women, Gail Johnson and Gigi Simmons. Um, on our county commission, we have one uh, black member, uh, Chuck Chestnut, who of course is a descendant of the uh, Chestnut of the Chestnut Funeral Home that we talked about earlier. Um, law enforcement, uh, Clovis Watson Jr. Uh, is our new sheriff. He just was elected, you know, in November. Um, and then our chief of police is Tony Jones. 
uh, who some of you certainly may know. Um, uh, the new president of Santa Fe College is Paul Brody, who hasn't been here too long, only during the age of COVID, but he's, he's the new uh, president. And um, our tax assessor was elected in November, uh, uh, Yesha uh, Solomon, who probably some of you just voted for a month or two ago. Um, in the past, we had, well, uh, several years ago, we had uh, Mayor Neil Butler, who was black. So the situation today, I argue, is quite different than it was before. Things are very different. But, there's a big but, B-U-T, but. But Gainesville has the largest racial inequity gap of any county in Florida. I want to repeat that. I'm going to repeat that. Alachua County has the widest gap in educational achievement between the races of any county in Florida. Look at these numbers. Today in Alachua County, 71.5% of white students score at or above uh, grade level in English, but only 67% of black students do. I want to re repeat that. I want you to remember those numbers. Those are pretty amazing. 71% of the white students score at or above grade level in English language arts, but 26.7% of black students do. Think of that gap. That is gigantic. Um, so obviously, uh, our work is cut out for us. What can we do about that? Now, the school system has announced a policy to eliminate this gap by 2028. That's only seven years from now. Do you think we can achieve that? I wonder. Um, there have been several reports, and in fact, you may know that in 2018, a couple of years ago, there was a report called Understanding Racial Inequity in uh, Alachua County, and there, there have been others. But um, to me, that's the one real takeaway from all this. We are left with the results of uh, separate but unequal, basically, and uh, Jim Crow and uh, segregated city within a city, and look what it's resulted in. We, we've got to turn that around. That's just um, uh, a recipe for disaster. So for my final slide, I would just point out that, um, you know, we have the Fifth Avenue Festival. Many of you may have gone down to that. They have it every year. And as you know, they have tents uh, along Fifth Avenue and along Pleasant Street. Um, and uh, you can buy all sorts of stuff uh, in these little tents that are set up and uh, entertainment. And so there's a lot of pride and a lot of memories and a lot of uh, hope and a lot of uh, uh, cultural uh, continuity. But we certainly have problems with us still uh, that we need to address. So, Ellen, that's the end of my formal presentation. Uh, let's throw it up open for questions, discussions, comments, observations, and issues. And I'm happy to stay here until you guys kick me off. Hey, um, there were a couple of questions from Catherine in the chat box, but I don't know if they're still there or not. Ellen, speak up, okay? Yeah, yeah, there were a couple of questions from Catherine in the chat box. I don't know if they're, if they're still there. Catherine Morsink, do you want to chime in? Uh, I'm unmuted, but the questions are written. Yes, okay. Well, one of them says, who owns Liberty Hill School now? Do we need permission to renovate it? Okay, the, the answer to the question is, that it is on the grounds of uh, the Baptist Church there, the Liberty Hill Baptist Church. So they own it. It's right, it's right on their. It's in their backyard. You know? um, so yeah, you'd, you'd have to uh, talk to the minister there and uh, and chat. But you know, uh, in addition to just doing that, you might also talk to, for example, um, uh, Santa Fe College, which is just around the corner. You know, and you can get students. Uh, also, you know, there's a, a building program at uh, Santa Fe where the, the students learn, uh, learn building techniques and construction and painting and ca uh, carpentry and whatever. And so you might uh, get some help and some cooperation that way. But yeah, you'd have to um, uh, get approval from the, the minister and, and probably somebody would have to decide what color, you know, 
that sort of thing. But I think that would be a, a really nice gesture, a very, uh, <clears throat> very fitting gesture. You okay. said Baptist church, you meant Methodist, right? Uh, liberty, let's see, did I, did I say that wrong? Um, you said Baptist. It, it's right on the slide. Do you want me to go back to that slide? It's United, it's United Methodist. It's, it's, it's okay. It's, it's a, all right. Um, let's see. Let me go back to that slide. Uh, whoa, wait a minute. I, let's see here. Hold on a second. Here it is right here. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I misspoke. I'm sorry. It's the okay. United Hill Methodist Church uh, at 2515 Northwest 77th Boulevard. Um, but, but in any case, it, it's right there, uh, you know, just north of uh, 23rd. Uh, almost when, you, when you're heading west, it's almost to uh, Santa Fe, but it's, it's not quite uh, as far west as Santa Fe. Okay. Uh, yeah, Williams? Um, yes, um, I wanted to say there's much I can say because I know a lot about the history that he is um, trying to present. Um, but the church is Greater Liberty Hill United Methodist Church. And the church is in that school is purposely um, allowed to stay the way it is for memory's sake. So they have carpenters in that church. It's no plans to paint it at all. It never was. And I'm a member of Mount Pleasant United Methodist Church and a lot of descendants who came, who um, um, their forefathers came from Camden, uh, South Carolina. And just recently, um, Dr. Ayer's son, who was a good friend of mine, Bobby Ayer, died and he had a lot of history. There's a lot of history in our church and a lot of historians. So I just want to say that much. There's much more I could say, but I want to stop right there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, another one from chat uh, says, says families of UF faculty may account for the inequities among the achievers. Um, Roy, was that tied into the gap? Achievement gap? Yes, it was. And I was wondering what uh, uh, Mr. Crow's opinion is of that. What, what I'm reading here, it says families of UF faculty may account for the inequities among the achievers. Are, are you um, suggesting that because we have so many people connected with academia in, in the university, that we may have unusually high uh, achievement rates among white students compared to blacks? Yes, and, and I suspect that the ratio of white faculty families to black faculty families is not equal. In other words, there are more white faculty families living at Gainesville. Well, I certainly don't have any statistics on it, but um, I would suggest you're probably right. Um, Gainesville, Alachua County, is a very academically oriented area compared to surrounding areas, or even compared to, say, a city like you know Jacksonville or Orlando or St. Petersburg or something. So we have a real stress on academics here. Um, but, I, but I would say something that I want to add, though. Um, I know a lot about the um, education achievement level in Tallahassee. And in many ways, Tallahassee has demographics similar to uh, Alachua County, um, you know, with a big university and so forth, and, uh, an educated population. And uh, Alachua County has much, much worse situation than uh, Leon County, which is uh, Tallahassee, uh, even though demographically they're, they're very similar. And uh, people really wonder, what's the difference between uh, Leon County, uh, Tallahassee, and Alachua County, Gainesville? I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, could I say something, Margaret Boonstra? Um, the, the, uh, I, I did not see in your uh, impressive list of, of Blacks who, um, who are uh, in public office here, uh, the three, white, uh, three Black women who uh, comprise uh, three-fifths of the Alachua County School Board. And uh, they just uh, got this majority 
in the elections last November. So they are very hopeful that uh, big strides will be made in this achievement, get, in closing this achievement gap. Uh, Let's see, on, our, on, on the school board, what's the number? Do we have five people on the school board? Five, this five yes. You're, you're suggesting three out of five. That, that's a majority. It is, three, three black women. And it resulted in the superintendent uh, resigning because uh, she did not have the, um, I think she tried really hard, but she did not have the uh, uh, confidence of the um, black community. Yeah, I, I should have put that in. That's, that's a very good point. Thank you. Annalise? Uh, when we moved to uh, to the U.S. and to to Gainesville, I was very surprised that because of this integration and all these uh, schools, when you look at churches, there are black churches, there are white churches. There's one God. Why do we have this difference that there is no mingling of, uh, of races? It's really very obvious somehow. Well, I'll speak up on that issue, just a person talking. Okay, good. I, I have found in my life that religious organizations become more and more about social, social. feel social functions, yeah. really rather than strictly religious functions. And that may be the reason that people tend to be, they want to be with people who share their social ideals or they're yeah. friends with or whatever. Dale Williams, you want to comment again? I do, I have my plan to. One is a question and the other one is just a comment I saw on the last slide that you had was of Dr. Patricia Hillard Nunn who was an expert about the history around in this county and other places. And she was an adjunct professor at the University of the President and everyone knows her there. And I was with her when they dedicated a marker out to um, Pleasant Plain United Methodist Church. I do know the marker is there. I have not seen, and, and they didn't say anything when we were out there doing the dedication about each of the six that they were that were lynched in that area and i also i could go further with that i want to stop right there i want to say um were you making reference to two separate restaurants because i know the one that had mama uh, and george on it on that sign that said mama's restaurant i know it was mom's kitchen is what we used to refer to it as and a husband and a wife ran that particular restaurant and Mama Lowell's daughter attended our church, and I guess she was too for some, I guess she did some time ago. I'm not sure about that. But were you making reference to two restaurants or were you making reference to one restaurant? Because that sign looked like the one that they had down there at um, Mom's Kitchen. Well, um, as I understand it, the word mom there um, is the, a woman who was associated with the two restaurants. The, the restaurant that today is said to be uh, Mom's Kitchen, it was newer. There was a previous one, and then they closed that earlier one, and they moved to the new location. So there were actually two restaurants that she was associated with. I don't think Mama Lowe's was associated with the one well, that, that the, young, the Youngs owned, but I'll ask her children because well, I know them uh, quite well. Well, no, well, no, 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 wait a um, minute. <laughs> Okay, Mama Lowe's was a different restaurant. That was over yes. on uh, on Thirteenth, right? Um, it was on Sixth Street. I so I say okay, um, but Mom's restaurant was different. That's the one that's just um, visible behind uh, Sweetberries today. You can just see it. It's that green and uh, orange house that if you're standing in the parking lot of Sweetberries, you can see it if you you know look east. So that's a different, different, totally different. Um, building or structure or restaurant. Right, because I visit that restaurant many times and their children know my family and I knew their parents who both are deceased now. I was just trying to get clarification as yep, to yep. whether we were talking about two different restaurants because yep. Mom's Kitchen was on Fifth Avenue, 
further west near um, 13th Street, and Mama Lowe's was what near the uh, current Gainesville Police Department. So I just wanted to clarify. There's a yeah, lot of history that I. Was a different, <laughs> yeah, it was a different okay. Thank you. I just want clarification. It's been great discussion. Does anyone else have any comments or questions? Ellen, do you have anything? You know, no. uh, Julianne, I'd like to just go ahead and say something. Go ahead, Lori. About the um, about the churches and whether why they're still divided. The difference between the schools and the churches then occurred to me. The money was put into white schools. And so that's why people wanted to be integrated because they wanted to benefit from the better textbooks and all the many things that were provided uh, in the schools. That, so I would say that would be the difference between the churches where you choose where to go because of your personal experience and the joy you feel or the companionship you feel and sending your kids to a better funded school. Hello. Well, this is my he hello. This is Mike Gingler. Uh, I couldn't figure out how to raise my hand, but uh, none of us really know the difference between Leon County and Alachua County as far as the factors that might make up the achievement gaps in both counties. And uh, Dr. Crow is correct that there is a much better uh, the blacks uh, on average in Leon County perform much better than the blacks in Alachua County. Again, on average on those tests. But we need to recognize that Florida a and University is in Tallahassee, and that might have something to do with it. Thank you. Mike, you're scheduled to uh, give one of these uh, lectures in this course here after a while, I think, aren't you? He already has. Already has, oh, okay, sorry. I had, I had the wrong day. Yeah, he's given two actually, which were excellent. Okay. He All led right, off great. our series. <laughs> yeah, I think taken together with what you just presented, Fletcher, we really have a better and more um, wide understanding of problems in Alachua County. And especially when it comes to, um, you know, the difference in the education between the blacks and the whites, which we still seem not to be able to have gotten our hands around. Um, you know, hopefully Santa Fe will be part of that project, um, but we really need to start with our public schools also. So I guess we'll see where the school board takes us now that we have a uh, majority of blacks on that board. Does anybody else have any questions or want to make any other comments? Annalise, I see you unmuted again. Did you have any comments? Uh, no, but I would like to thank you for this, Ellen and, uh, and Fletch, of course, for this wonderful presentation. And I think you, you're doing a great job, uh, Julianne, too. Thank you. Thank you. Fletcher, sure, it was a, a really, really good presentation. and. Um, your your powerpoints are extremely helpful yeah. in understanding the history and the chronology of what went on here um, and i thank you for the effort you put into this because i know it was a big effort well thank you um thank you very much we'll have to uh, maybe one of these days get a little bus and go around and uh visit a bunch of these sites what do you say yeah we could talk about that could see how many people would be interested in doing that and you know maybe maybe make that part of our ILR program. Well thank you very much everybody.